important again. Almost reported the Discord chat for a sec. Okay. All right. We're good to go. Awesome. Okay, we're starting now. All right, we're live. All right, so we're finally here. We're finally at the Iron Maiden episode. Um, we kind of had a hiatus for a while, and then now we're back and at it, hopefully up to speed on both ends. I, for one, am excited for these guys because reviewing their albums is really interesting. They're not like any other metal band, and even British Wave of Heavy Metal or British New Wave of Heavy Metal, even that, they kind of stand alone. And they're a very upbeat, positive metal band, which is, you know, a bit cheesy, but I think it's unique for um, a lot of rock and roll stuff. And I think they're also, as a genre, kind of a tour de force. And, uh, again, again, they stand alone. Uh, they're, they basically invented power metal, um, or at least started the invention they kind of prefigured the invention of power metal yeah um and they've been touring you know with a similar lineup for ever i mean they're like they're like vikings they just tour they just you know cart themselves around and then just sort of you know wreck wherever they're like a wrecking crew you know destroying the landscape wherever they go it's kind of wild uh yeah and, and like they're they're, they're a real sto- like maelstrom you know so what do you think? I think the amazing thing about this band, and I'll just I'll just say full disclosure that Iron Maiden is probably my pick for favorite band, and I yeah think the main reason why is because I there are so many there are so many, I mean, I'm mainly like rock metal I like the most, but I mean, um, there are so many other artists that sound kind of similar to others or there are others trying to duplicate and they kind of end up pulling it off iron maiden is a band that absolutely no one sounds like and that is yeah insane and they've never yeah. they've always they, i'm not saying they've always stuck to one path because they've made as you'll see soon many changes along the way in their well, there's no one no one successful there's no one really successful that sounds like yeah them. there are people that have gone through phases that or maybe have done a song that sounds like iron maiden but rarely do they maintain a sound that sounds like iron yeah. maiden and that's why they that's why they they stay so distinctive as a as a, a tour de force and I, I i just think of them as like in this old voyager tradition of you know like you know raiding different you know towns in england like the vikings going over like i think there's something so like uh uh anglo-saxon about them or very like norse you know and uh uh and the fact that they have changed their sort of style in terms of the album art over the years but it's always been that same cartoon and it's always been kind of a a similar uh, aggressive you know um uh intention I think they're one of the more consistent bands that I've ever listened to. Um, now, that doesn't mean I like every album, but it does mean that I I can appreciate... I, they're hard to criticize for me because they really have sort of this perfectionism going on. Yeah, and I think in that regard, I think they're in a way kind of like Saxon, which we did talk about. Um, granted, I think they were both born out of the same movie. They are like Saxon. Saxon's the closest one to them in maybe style. And then Judas Priest is probably the closest one to them in influence. Um, but yeah, I, I still I still think Iron Maiden is like a world unto itself. It's a little like being a, a fan of like the Misfits and Punk. You know, it's like they kind of they're kind of in a league of their own. And yeah, they are metal. And yeah, Misfits is punk. But they're almost like a separate sort of pop oriented version that's like transcends the limitations of the genre. Yeah. So without without um with their respective genres cuz we're talking about two different bands there. But yeah, I uh so going going forth, man, um the, the debut album self-titled Iron Maiden released I believe April 14th, 1980 on the EMI label. In CD, CS, Before we continue, I, LP, I you, and track format. I send you the list. Uh, <laughs> let me send the link to you now. That's on me. So I'm looking... No, I have, I have the list. I have the oh, list. I mean like the... It's... Uh, I have the tier list up on the video. What? 
Oh, the tier list. Yeah, I sent me that yeah. too. Yeah, because we're this. This is also as a visual component. Um, and this album, by the way, went platinum in the in in the Canada and platinum in the UK, gold in Germany, gold in the US. Um, number four on the UK charts. Yeah, that's kind of insane. Iron Maiden. <laughs> by the way, do you know what is a CS? Oh, okay, that's compact cassette. Okay. Man, can you imagine this? When this album was released in 1980, early for, April 14, 1980, um, EMI had put out for them CD, compact, cassette, LP, and an 8 track. There's four formats you could buy this album in, in back in 1980. And all of them are technically obsolete now. Kind of crazy. Uh. Anyway, so yeah, I mean, I was honestly, I the, the the debut album is is it's a cool album. It's not like amazing, you know. It's not like uh, knocking my socks off every time. It, it's kind of like I would call it kind of like um, a warm up album. It feels like they're really getting their sound figured out and they're sort of showcasing it, but they don't really have like a like a spirit yet. And uh, it does kind of have a little bit of a punk flavor sometimes, but it doesn't it doesn't have the tasty like blues licks that the uh, I think Killers has or some other albums can kind of pull off. Um, so as a um, it's not really the force majeure you might expect it to be. It doesn't really come out of left field, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm wide open on this one. I, I don't really I'm not really too surprised by anything. Uh, that said, it's a cool album. I can't knock it, but I can't really praise it either. I think it's about a B or possibly a B plus. I think this is where you and me kind of split, because on okay, at, at least from my point of Fair view, enough. I I have the spread the spreadsheet. I tend to be kind of hard. Okay. I, I tend to be kind of hard on debut albums historically, like with Saxon and. Okay. Hell, even even Black Sabbath, I feel like I might have been a little hard on, even though that did get an A in our list. Um, yeah, I think with Iron Maiden on the other yeah. hand, I think they knocked it out immediately. It's not their best album, but they it's or it's not. Already. I think it's hard to compare it to. I think yeah, it's like already they have everything down. They have. It just bit they just need to refine it a bit more. It's maybe not as experimental. It's basically a new wave of British heavy metal album. And granted, I just didn't find right. I I think you're you're on point. It's it's a, a very fine album. I just felt like it wasn't um, melodic and sort of catchy the way that their like next few albums tend to be. And it does obviously that the, the commercially is reflected by the lack of hits that came off of it. Mm -hmm. um, I just I, I I think it's it's a good setup for later albums, but I don't think it's like a go to album for me. I think I'm I I think for me it's like one of my for me one of my personal favorites, but personal doesn't necessarily mean it's okay. the best. It's kind of like um, what's a guilty pleasure? Kind of like Black Sabbath's album Tear where that's like a personal favorite of mine, but I recognize it's not great. It's not even the best Tony Martin. Sure, sure, yeah. But Okay, no, I, I feel it. I, I understand. I um I think this album is um praiseworthy, but not in the same classic sense of praise that the other ones are. Um so yeah, I'll give it I give it a B plus. What do you think? I, I personally think it A, but I don't think it should go any higher. But census is a minus. Yeah, I guess. And a yeah, minus. a minus is sort of the, the average between your answer and my answer. Yeah. Um. So, all right, moving on. Um. Uh, we have a uh, following up 1980s Iron Maiden. We have uh, early 1981 Killers, February 2nd to be exact. Still EMI. Still all the same four formats. Uh, it did not place as highly on the UK chart, and it didn't go platinum in the UK ultimately, but it did in Canada. However, in, in more countries, it went gold. Like uh, New Zealand, it went gold. Sweden, it went gold. Um, uh, Germany, UK, and US, it was all gold. That's five. Uh, 
I would say this is a more polished version of the first album. This is their sophomore album. They're really like they're really figuring out the m- melodic stuff that was missing from the first one. They're really kind of harmonizing more on Killers. They're I I what's what's like they have um it's still the Ides of March is cool. Genghis Khan of course, Murders in the Room Morgue. I remember this one having more standout songs than than the original debut album. Uh, also, it's got um, a, just a better sound than, than the first one, but not by too much. But it is noticeable. Uh, they, 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 I think the, just the arrangement and sort of between the ba- the rhythm and the leads and vocals is a little more uh, fine tuned. Um, yeah, I mean, I would give this one an A minus, personally. I think this album is excellent. It is, I think I agree with you in the way that it is a lot more refined, a lot more of the melodic pieces are here. I want to give special mention to, I feel like, kind of an overlooked vocalist in Paul Diano. On these first two albums, he does an excellent job, especially on Killers, where I feel like, um, I I really want to, I want to highlight his vocals specifically on... The song "Murders in the Room Morgue," which I I feel like yeah, that's a good one. I mean, really, this whole but in 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 general, I feel like the musicianship is a lot tighter too. This is the first album with Adrian Smith on the second guitar. The first album had Dennis Stratton, but there was some like backstage drama. I think Dennis Stratton was listening to Eagles when he was in the shower and. The band didn't like that, so they kicked him out or some bullshit like that. <laughs> it's it's really weird, but it's pretty fun. He did end up going to join Praying Mantis, so, another new wave British heavy metal band, and that's more his style, more of like a melodic. Would you but you 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 say would you say Praying Mantis sounds like Maiden or not so much? They're like because I'm not familiar. They're with like them. Iron Maiden if they are if they went more squarely into hard rock after their first album. Oh wild! Wow. I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah, they're, that's that's super they're newer cool. Albums, and Boy, are uh, more st- like cheesy '80s style, like radio rock. But everything else, I know what you mean. Like really long vocal stretches that don't don't mean anything. Yeah, lots of I, I heavy you. keyboards. Bro, too, the later they get, blast beats for no reason. Uh, if you've ever heard an album from the Frontiers, okay, cool. from like the Frontiers record label, it oh. sounds like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right fair but enough they're the 90s stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. highly recommend well, the power metal album in the late 90s from them too okay there you go uh, absolutely um i'll I'll, get, I'll delve into that pretty soon um by the way you think uh I, I know i said motorhead would be the next one on um that we do i was thinking we could do uh judas priest after this just uh just to keep him keep it i think pre- keep the momentum i honestly going. kind of think priest would be a bit more fun yeah, I think so too. Yeah, Made it, Motorhead is cool, but I don't know if I could listen to like fifty Motorhead albums. You know, what I mean, and get and get as much nuance out. There, of it. I think, where, where maybe is, twenty-two or twenty-four Motorhead albums, and I think that's just a lot, especially when it comes to the, some of the. That's a lot for a band. Uh, it's and it, to be fair, I think it's a lyrical band for, in, in a lot of ways. So like, I I'm not. I would I would I would be tired out listening to all those lyrics. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Judas Priest. Yeah, Judas Priest will be next. But in the meantime, now cover, I really... is the time for Iron Maiden. Oh uh, yeah, back to Maiden. Back to Maiden. Um, I think this is the first really, truly good album cover. I know that the first one is sentimentally cool, but it does, it's a little weird looking. Um, and I think this, uh, obviously the, uh, there's an alternative color that looks a bit better. But I think Killers has the first properly cool album co- cover for Maiden. Yeah, I think this is um, probably one of my favorite album covers. I think not just for Maiden, but in general. It, it's not my favorite Maiden cover. We will eventually get to that, and I will be so happy to talk about that when we get to it. But I think... Th- oh, Martin Birch produced it, which probably explains some of the difference. He also produced... Um, their next eight albums until Fear of the Dark in 1992. Yeah, that was his last album. So we're going to bring him back a lot. I think he retired. And this is also, you know, he might, yeah, you might be right there, yeah. And then uh, Adrian Smith is the played on this album for the first time. Yeah. Another 
uh, foot. So yeah, um, what's your letter grade for Honestly, Iron Man? I I might say, hmm, you know, this one's a little bit tough for me because on one hand, I think it is very, it's so close to S. Killers. But on the other hand, I feel like there's maybe one song that doesn't it's... work all the way for me, and that's Prodigal Son. And okay, that okay. Kind of hold, so A plus. It's kind of like I think A plus because Prodigal Son's trying to do the same thing a similar thing to what strange world did on the debut and while i feel like on on the debut i think every song works even if they don't really reach the highs of killers on this one like prodigal son just kind of feels almost like a step back on an otherwise forward looking album right yeah um okay yeah i couldn't have said it better um all right, so moving on from Killers, we gave it a cons- we give you give it a plus, I give it an a minus, so we balance it out to an a. And then um, up next we have the they're probably their most famous album is their third album, and that's 1982, The Number of the Beast. The first. Uh, re- Paul Diano's out. Release 22. Yeah, he's oh yeah the new yeah Paul Diano's out, and Bruce Dickinson's the primary vocalist, oh, only vocalist that really. Yeah. The counts coming from a band called and uh, and and this is also the last one with drummer Clive Burr. What was his band called before? I don't I don't know that that lore Clive there. Clive Burr's band or Bruce well, Dickinson's? The one you well, mentioned, yeah. Bruce yeah. Dickinson's former band was called Samson. They were more of Sam- like Samson, named after their guitarist Paul Samson. And they were oh, okay. more, they're a little bit like Praying Mantis. They're more of like, actually not really, because Praying Mantis is more like straighter, like Thin Lizzy type hard rock. And then they turn into like more straight ahead, like hard rock. Samson started out a lot more bluesy with like, they had a okay. debut album and then they got Bruce Stick. His stage name at the time was Bruce Bruce. <laughs> um... And they he recorded two albums with them, including the excellent um, Shock Tactics. But then he left the band to join Iron Maiden. We'll get to the we'll get to that soon. His legacy with that, but eventually Simpson would make a few albums in the '80s, two excellent blues metal albums with a guy named Nicky Moore, and oh, really cool. Okay, not ex one great one, and then a really cool one. And an album called Refugee in the in the early '90s that was, I would really recommend if you. That's more praying man to see though. And they didn't. Otherwise, they didn't really never achieve the same success that Maiden did, and they kind of just fizzled out after a while. But Bruce, that's the main reason why that the, it has to do with a lot of business practices, according to the management of Samson. Which is the reason why Bruce left to join Maiden. So here we are. How do you feel about this album? Yeah, no, I um, so I I would say that this album, you know, it's got it really uh, it's kind of the, their magnum opus in a way. It's their commercial. I think it might be their commercially most successful album. Um, it's their first top ten UK single was. Uh, number of the beast uh it was a controversial album because it had some religious references of course and uh i think it's a little bit un- of a predictable album in terms of it being high quality especially side b with uh run to the hills number of the beast and hallowed be of thy name kind of highlighting it and obviously, you know, you go to the, no matter what edition you get, the side, the second side is probably going to have those three. And the side A is it, like the Japanese side B also has those songs plus an extra one. So side B is going to be the go-to, and side A is going to be kind of like a warm-up. But I felt like side A, um, um, you know, it's just not my favorite personal favorite Iron Maiden album. Yeah, I think I'm in a similar boat to you in that. I feel like side A, I feel like outside of, I think the I like the first few tracks. Invaders is cool. Children of the Damned is great. But then after that, I feel like The Prisoner might be one of my least favorite Maiden songs. And then 22 Acacia after Yeah, they had fine. some weird... They had some weird thing about The Prisoner where they wanted the Patrick McGugan to, like, you know, 
like they wanted permission from him and they called him up and got permission to use his TV show's theme in the song. It's really kind of like a an archaic song uh, concept that hasn't really aged well. It's kind of based around a TV show. Yeah. So that was popular in the 60s, uh, I th- believe, or early 70s at, at, at most, at latest. But yeah, so The Prisoner, yeah, the, the first side is kind of a weird uh, like lead-in to side B. And so for that reason, this album is a little lopsided. But I think it is a um, kind of their most iconic album yeah. and kind of their uh, the one that people they're most known for. Um, is it my personal favorite? Absolutely not. But I do respect it a ton, and I would give it an S. I think I'm gonna go an A. I don't. I think I prefer Killers between this and the. I think maybe as an album, as a fully like yeah. as a fully formed album, balance on balance. Yeah, probably not an S. But if you had to do side B, it'd probably be an S. I think right? if side B were the whole, it's kind of like Crusader, the Saxons Crusader, but backwards. I think on that album, side A, sure. if side if the whole album was like side A, it could have been S. For this, if the whole album was like side B, it could have been an, like their best album with, you know, the aforementioned epics. And I'd like to highlight right. Gangland too. Really furious song. Um. Oh sure. Okay. I'll, you know what? I'll give it an A for the whole album. Yeah, I think. Uh, as a whole, it what just do you, what do you, what held do you, back a bit. I think A. I agree with you on A. But I'm not okay, sure. Okay. I, I think I slightly prefer Killers. Okay, well, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I think for me, the reason I, I wouldn't go so far to say that is because I do like Killers a lot, but I think... Uh, number of the beast while it, while it's slow on on the take in the first side that's kind of part of what makes this this, this the second side cool is that it's like a lot it better kind of explodes. so yeah so i uh i i kind of like that it's i could i could see both sides to that argument but for for now i'll just go with a and leave killers a minus for me mm-hmm. And then, and the cons- by the way, the consensus was still A for both. Yeah, regardless. So, like, you, you did A plus regardless, yeah. Um, Clive Burr is out. Okay, uh, so, you, so we did both A on that one. What was, okay, Number of the Beast. The Number of the Beast, actually. It's not Number of the Beast. Yeah, it's the, the Number of the Beast. Number of the Beast. All right, what's next? Peace. Uh, Peace of Mind. Ooh, fourth studio album. By English heavy metal man Iron Maiden, released in 1983, May 16th, EMI yet again. And in you, by the way, in the United States, they, I guess they're not using EMI so much. They tend to use Capitol Records to release in the U.S. Just to be clear. Um, and this is the first album to include Nico McBrain, who recently left the band Trust, according to Wikipedia. And uh, he has been Iron Maiden's drummer ever since. And that is why we actually are doing this podcast is because he had an injury and we wanted to release this episode in sort of a commemoration or a tribute to, to Nico. So, um, that just, just, just a heads up there. Yeah. And, uh, he but yeah, beyond that, what do you think of this album? He was partially paralyzed by a stroke, which was why he, is he slow? Has he recovered? Um, I, not a hundred, I don't think fully recovered his, there was a tour that they did recently where, Notably, they played Alexander the Great, which we'll get to for the first time ever on that tour. And I wish I could have been there to see it. But I believe they had to play a bit that slower awesome. because of how... Because of Nico's recovery. I know what you mean, man. I know. So these guys are... They guys are eight, they're so old now. And and uh, apparently there's, one, there's a major festival out by the Coachella. Like, Coachella has, is in Indio, California. And there was a major rock festival there that had, like, Maiden was there and, like, Tool and Guns N' Roses and ACDC. And apparently they all were, like, really kind of going crazy. Like, it was a pretty major festival. Oh, that sounds And they hadn't – they hadn't. and I, 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 I totally missed out. I mean, it was kind of expensive to get down to it, but I still was, like, you know, crossing my fingers. And I just – I it never happened. So I'm kind of bummed out about that. 
But I did go to an Alice Cooper and a Rob Zombie combo concert. And that one was weird. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you got Alice Cooper and Rob Zombie. <laughs> Rob Zombie had so much more energy, you know, and Alice Cooper, uh, I I was actually kind of disappointed a little because he was he barely really interacted with the audience, like you know, like I thought he, I guess maybe he's just done it so often, he just yeah, he's sort of in and out, you know. I think he's. Uh, I, you think he would interact more, but he just doesn't. I want to know. Do they do very they play roses on white lace? No, I don't think Damn so. It. I, I would have remembered. My, I think that's my favorite Alice Cooper song from the, the the album with his face on a fist you know, they, <laughs> i was looking for welcome to my nightmare and i guess i was expecting Wait, they didn't play it, that. and they didn't play it no they play almost every other song i like but what you know yeah it was it was a good it was a good set it was just really like cut and dry like there, there wasn't of that many surprises you know they played like eight i'm 18 they played like uh they they kind of ended with schools out and then they turned it into uh we don't need no education you know another brick in the wall they kind of did that too they did um feed my frankenstein they did like they did all the ones um uh poison yeah they did they did all like the main ones all the hits except uh uh you know welcome to my nightmare and the one you when you mentioned it. I actually don't know that song. What's it called? Roses, Roses on White Lace. Probably, I think, his most aggressive song. One of his most aggressive songs. A I'll, I'll, you know, I'll have to hear it. Yeah. So you can send it to me later, maybe. Yeah. So because I might forget, but yeah. I'll definitely listen. Anyway, um Peace. so wh- where we're at now is Peace of Mind. When I first got in the Maiden, this was probably my favorite album because I didn't really know where to go. And I was like looking at Killers and Peace of Mind because I they seemed a little off brand from like the Number of the Beast or Power Slave, which are the most high octane album covers by far. Um, Peace of Mind, I mean, you know, you could get into it with it, but I think Power Slave and Number of the Beast are the most high octane covers. Um, Peace of Peace of Mind is a uh, good album but when i was re-listening to it i I kind of realized it wasn't as good as i i initially thought it was i would say this might even be like a b plus album um admittedly i which is low not for what we've been doing admittedly i'm not really the biggest fan of this album granted i think i think as a whole good tracks yeah, there's i mean peaks really where he was air revelations the trooper i i really love uh flight of victory the is probably their signature yeah. song at this point i feel like like if i had to pick one song that defines it's band. a little it's a little grating to hear to hear their super hits um sometimes so yeah to hear, just hear like an album stacked with their super hits kind of it gets grating and um I feel a little like insipid listening to it, but that doesn't mean I can't take a step back and appreciate it. Um, and I do think this album is high oct- is high quality, um, but but it's not as high octane as like uh, Somewhere in Time. I really yeah. like too, and like Fear of the Dark is also kind of good. Um, I would say Peace of Mind is for me might be a little it might be somewhere in time level, um, which we're gonna get to. Uh, so I would say a B plus. Uh, I think I'm gonna say I agree with peace of mind and B. Yeah. I don't really have that much to say about this album, I'm gonna be honest. I think... Oh, yeah, actually, there is yeah, something very important. To Tame a Land is their... Like, the t- 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 eh, To Tame a Land is their first attempt at a full-on epic since Hell It Be Thy Name. And... I'm not going to really say it 100% works, but they will eventually hone that craft. I do think it is very important in the context of the band, though. And it's based off Dune, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, um, this, a lot of these songs have been covered by... Uh, I mean, these are pretty, you know, it's a pretty established album, really. Um, I just felt like it, it, it wasn't as personally appealing as uh fear of the dark or somewhere in time yeah uh and uh and so i think it's sort of in that un- unfortunate circumstance where it's 
trying to be cagey and sort of gritty and um ptsd kind of like it's trying to be like appealing to like you know the broken man syndrome kind of dudes but it's it to me it doesn't really go that far with it it just sort of like sort of leans into it but not too much and that's a kind of that's kind of a letdown so i would say b and then um um yeah also fun fact this was mostly recorded in, in um in the bahamas and then, uh, which is kind of hard to believe. I think that that's and that then, uh, for this album. And I didn't know this, but me- Nico McBrain was in the same band as Pat Travers, <laughs> which is, uh, which in, in, in trust, which is really surprising. So anyway, so we'll, we'll move, we'll move from there to, um, the next one, 1984's Power Slave. Yeah, this is probably one of their most famous albums, um, this I, before anything, I really want to get to this freaking album cover. One of my my favorite of Maidens, and I I love this cover art so much. I did a report on it for class. Okay. okay. And right, right, got yeah. A full score on it, so you know it was worth it. Honestly, one it's they're probably their most um popping uh cover. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty great album. It's got like, you know, um, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It's over the top, right? Yeah. It's got Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, The Duelists, Power Slave. It's also got, and then it, that's not like weren't cool enough. You have the, their main songs, just Aces High and Two Minutes to Midnight, which are your songs I just hear over and over in my head. I'm you know, just thinking about. So uh, it's a pretty awesome stacked album. Probably um, a lot, but got a lot more energy than Peace of Mind. A lot more sort of, um, um, I wouldn't call it brilliance, but it's got a lot more uh, uh, radiance. I don't know. It's got what do you want? Energy. How do you want to spin it? Like it's, it's got a lot more kinetic and vitality. Yeah, more vitality. Let's yeah. say yeah, and very kinetic. It does not like, yeah. let up. And um, and doesn't let up. It's probably their most sort of just like. It's got, the, for all their albums considered, it's probably got the most punch. I would say, um, uh, I would give it an A minus. Um, wait. I thought I just heard something. I don't know what was, but that was. Yeah, I think, I'm not sure. It's, it's in A for sure. It's in that A zone. I agree with that. But yes, yeah, no, no, yeah, I agree, I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, All right, A minus for me. What do you want to give it? I think a straight ahead A. I think it's better than the debut. Maybe Number of the Beast. Maybe. Maybe. Better, better than the debut, and then it's it's toe to toe with Number of the Beast. I I can see that. And. All right. Uh, um. And um, I, I'm kind of, uh, I, I mean, it's it's just a little over the top for me. I would give it like an A instead of an A minus, but it's just a little overbearing with the rhyme of the ancient Mariner, Mariner going on and on forever. Yeah. Uh, but I do, I, I can't hate on it too strongly, but like, I just feel like it's a little overwhelming. That is a whole album. It's an overwhelming detractor that has to be acknowledged. Yeah, it's not right? too long of an um, album. It's just that like it's. It's a very heavy. The album, album is not too long. I mean, it's not like a, it's not a doable album. No. It, and by the way, it it, it did peak um, in the Nor- Norwegian charts, um, or but I think it might have only gotten to Norway in 1992. I'm actually kind of confused by that's this metric here. Uh, yeah, maybe that's just when they found the data uh, and it recovered the data. Anyway, in um, 1984, Norwegian it was five, UK was two. Finland was four, Germany nine, Netherlands was five, um, and a bunch of others were in like 15, 11, you know, 21, 10 for Sweden, 10 for Switzerland. The lowest one on this list was Australia, which is 26, but everywhere else it was pretty, it was peaking on the charts. And uh, certification, United States, it went platinum. Canada went double platinum. Um, 
Although I think in Canada that's a different sort of uh, indicate. I don't know me, that 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 certification is a different ratio of units per sale or whatever. But um, and unfortunately in Germany, Japan, Spain, United Kingdom it only went gold. So uh, yeah, definitely one of their their probably their second most important album for their career after Number of the Beast. Now up next we have Somewhere in Time. Uh, um, guitar synth. If if Power Slave is an is an A, I think somewhere in time, I like it a lot. Um, I might give it an S. I might have to give it an S. Okay, so you want you ready for this? I agree with you. <laughs> and you and in okay, fact, cool. I, I'm All gonna right. go into a little bit of a. I'm gonna go into just a tiny bit. Of just a little bit of an introduction, not an introduction, but a, a few w- words I have to say because this album, I, I, it's very hard to to call for many people. It is very hard to name their favorite song, their favorite album. This album is definitively my favorite album of all time. I love really? every like solitary second of this album to death. There is it. It has a lot of the aggression of Power Slave, but it isn't as over the top. It's a lot more sleek with the guitar synthesizers. It's the every single song is f- fucking amazing. I feel like like it's like everything that it almost feels like Power Slave. If they gave it the melody of Killers or Number of the Beast, and then added a bit of like a futuristic, almost Blade Runner esque sheen, and we have, I, I don't even know. I can't even. I can't do this album justice personally. I'll let you talk about it because. <sighs> I think it's um. You know, uh, I'm reading the some commentaries. On this Wikipedia page, that Dickinson uh, wanted to make it more like a like a physical graffiti or Led Zeppelin IV. He really wanted it to be kind of like a midpoint for the band, and um, you know, the high point, midpoint, whatever the uh, the climax. And I think it really was. I, I this this album. Every time I listen to it, I get more sentimental than I do with the other ones, the earlier albums or and the later ones. I think this album has a lot of just. Um, uh, you know, elusiveness, not, not elusiveness, elusiveness. Like it, it sort of feels like it, it connects to the zeitgeist a bit more. Um, it feel, it doesn't feel as mythological. It feels more, I mean, obviously you have like Alexander the Great, but beyond that, it doesn't feel mythological. It feels kind of grounded and sort of like an awareness of society. Now to be fair, Alexander the Great isn't technically a myth, but it's close. Um, and, uh, wasted years i'm like oh man these guys they it's it's a little more perspectival it's a little more philosophical it's a it's an album that actually tries to have some depth in it for a band that really doesn't care that much for depth it's more of a party band uh this album doesn't it kind of foregoes that sort of um politeness and tries to be uh um meditative for an interesting change so yeah, I think this is a sort of a transcendental album for them, and it really, uh, you know, it's like it, it's a it's a it's not a return to form or anything, but it, it, it's a new take that is sort of like a, a it's like a, a wrinkle in time kind of, and uh, yeah, I I'm a big fan of this one. It might be my favorite album in the genre of uh, new wave of British heavy metal. Yeah, I well, I mean, I obviously agree with you on that. I <laughs> this is my favorite album after all, you know. But um, I think what's very important about this album. I'm actually, I'm actually so excited. I mean, I'm I'm so in awe of it that I haven't looked at any like like trivia. Uh, I mean, certified platinum. Yeah, it went platinum in the U.S. Something interesting though about this album that I am a little shocked by is the. After the tour for the album, most of the songs from this album were never played again. 
besides Wasted Years and I think Heaven Can Wait until the most recent uh-huh. tour where they played basically the rest of the album. Oh, uh, man, I got to see that tour. Damn. Ah, I'm so annoyed. I'm missing all these great these great concerts. Okay, anyway. Um... Uh... Yeah, so, so um, with that, I mean, there's not a lot more we can say. I do like the cyberpunk Blade Runner kind of nods. It's just really kind of an edgy album but it's also kind of sleek and chic at the same time so maybe there's a a sort of a fashionista in me that likes this one it's a little just it's a little more polished um anyway up next and by the way this is kind of the last sort of classic iron maiden album in my in my book i mean yeah you get after somewhere in time you know the 80s are winding down and it becomes more like you're running up into the grunge era um and i think we start to see this with the sev- with the next album, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, I, I feel like you start to see a decline. I I do agree with you that there is a bit of a decline because, granted, I mean you can't go up after somewhere in time, but um I do feel like somewhere in time was like the last of their classic because I, I feel like starting after this they would try they would at the end of the eighties and into the nineties they would try to throw a lot of different things at the wall eventually resulting in a complete genre and a near complete style change but i think this album was important at least in providing a more introspective and a more introspective lyrical content that would at least be followed up on on most of the future albums but then we get to seventh son yeah and I, well, the last remark i have on That is the most comic booky for me, and that it, le- it lends huge appeal. That to me, that means it, it, it's sort of again capturing the zeitgeist. It's really connected. Um, yeah, but Seven Son of the Seven Son is almost is probably the the did I say least? I meant most comic booky, right? I said I said most, mm-hmm. right? Okay, yeah. So, with that said, the ne- the follow up album in 1988, Seventh Son of the Seventh Son is not very comic booky at all and i kind of felt this one to be a little grating and repetitious um it's not like you know doggerel but it just it's way less interesting of a of a of a stitched together album yeah it's still pretty good but it's just way less interesting i i start to feel like i'm sort of dealing with with not the same band on this album now um they're to be fair they're going off in more like you know parapsychological direction they're not really doing you know the same themes that they used to do they're going off into more murkier waters and uh shakier territory but, but what do you think i think that on seven son of a seven son i think it's a lot more of a uh I feel like they're trying to do a bit more of like a progressive rock or progressive or early progressive metal thing where the songs are getting a bit longer. There's This is a concept album. They're one and only true concept album. Um, telling the story of uh, the seventh son of a seventh... Uh, yeah, the seventh son, which in a, it's just supposed to give him, I think... S- I forgot what telepathic powers of some kind or uh, visions of the future. Yeah, it, to, it, they were they were just trying too hard. It's it, yeah, and it's based it's on a book he read by Orson Scott. He came. I mean, or if you're gonna write a, a novel, a, a, an al, a concept album that's you know inspired by a book, I would hope it wouldn't be one by Orson Scott Card. You know, that's just <laughs> this is me. But then the the Maiden just goes and does it after making like their best album ever. They just fall up with strange tribute album so i um i mean not you know what i mean it's a it's a strange um take on on a on a not very popular novel by a fantasy writer and i'm so i'm like i don't know i don't know what to say i'm i feel like this is i will say though that this is definitely still a good album i do really like this i just think it's very bookended like the middle section kind of really really sags at times especially I don't, especially the title track, I think, and the prophecy. 
Okay. But I do feel like it picks up a lot at the end with the, the clairvoyance, probably my favorite on this album. Um, and yeah, it, it kind of goes back to a lot of that somewhere in time energy that I was that was missing from the rest of the album. And only the good die young and the opening track, Moonchild. But otherwise, I think it's it does feel like they're sort of out of ideas, like they're just going off of like yeah. I, I did hear this is very this album I songwriter under- was very dominated by Bruce Dickinson and Adrian Smith. Um, when Adrian Smith is okay. is the most progressive, like he's the progressive one out of all of them. Um, so that oh, does make yeah, some sense. Sure. Yeah, that- and that will eventually provide a schism. As after this album, he would leave. Oh, I'm sure for many albums. <laughs> to do his own wow. thing. Wow, wow. And in his place, they got Yannick Gers from, I think, Ian Gillen's solo band and Bruce Dickinson's first solo album, Tattooed Millionaire, which is just, it's basically a Van Halen album with Bruce Dickinson singing. Which, that's... Okay. <laughs> that one's funny. There's a song called Dive, Dive, Dive. And I'll let I'll let you guess what it's about. It has lots of mentions of submarines and sea. Diver down. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. Um. It's one of those kinds of albums. It's basically full on cock rock. Well, and that's the that's the next one. Which which, no, which one are you saying? Bruce Dickinson oh, solo oh. album, which is where they got their new guitarist. From oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Girls. Oh yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah, like a David Lee Roth, you know, like wannabe yeah. moment. Anyway, so um, seven, 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 seven. How do you how do you rank? rank Honestly, it? B, really, just low B. Not bad enough to be C. I give it a B, great B minus. Yeah, B minus. Okay. All right, and then um, no praise for, this. for the dying. Oh, wait, hold on. No, pr- up next is No Prayer for the Dying, which is 1990. Yeah, the last Derek this one's pretty cover good. art. Oh, yeah, really? after this. Why did they, why did they see? see, I think Derek Riggs, Derek Riggs was having a lot of disagreements with, at this point, the band leader, Steve Harris, the bassist. And okay, okay. he wanted to do like these like these like crazier kinds of artwork for these albums like as we can especially see with seventh son of a seventh son which is admittedly a really nice looking cover but with no prayer for the dying as the band wanted to go back to basics with the music and wanted to do a bit more of like a snarly um acdc meets gillen type thing um they right. wanted the cover art to be something more simplistic, like, oh, we want Eddie busting out of the ground. And Derek Riggs did it, but thought it was too simple and just decided to call it a day with the band and do his own stuff. So this is the last time we see his cover. Coincidentally, it's also their last uh, single LP album, as everything after this would be distributed amongst two. A taste of things to come. <laughs> uh wait, wait wait distributed amongst what yeah, okay so this is and cd yeah, no prayer for the dying like if we're i have all these albums on vinyl um and literally all of them okay and this is the last one that they released that can fit on one vinyl record disc oh like oh, side wow. side uh, yeah okay. everything else is split up into right. two lps from Fear of the Dark to The Final Frontier. Sure. And then the la- the most two recent albums are on three of them. <laughs> Apparently, this is album, some trivia wor- worth knowing. Uh, footnote, uh, um, as it were. This is the first album to uh, have keyboards. And then Somewhere in Time only had uh, synth effects that weren't keyboard based but this one is the first album to have keyboards and also um seventh son was the first I... that's what i meant yeah. sorry we're, we're, we're yeah we, we did that no prayer for the dying is where we are now this is the last one with the art um uh with uh derek riggs's art and uh yannick gares replace adrian smith okay i'm i'm, I'm sorry I, yeah 
Uh, where? I find that this one's a pretty good one. And the Forerunner albums had, but it's it's a good it's a good like you know like barbecue kind of album. Like it's just sort of like no fuss it made in. And uh, I, I, like you're saying, I think there was some bluesiness to it, but I, I, I don't necessarily love that. Although um, sometimes it can be kind of a welcome surprise. So for me, this is probably like in a B area, maybe a B plus. I think, or maybe just a B even. I think this sounds really interesting because this definitely seems like it almost felt like after Smith left, like they really did feel like they should go in a more it almost feels like an acdc album at times and that is absolute. that is not a knock i'll say that um because on this album they happen to do that sound particularly well um bruce dickinson on this um also is trying to he has a lot more rasp to his voice he does a lot a bit more a bit more of a grittiness um almost oh. like um Battle Rage is on era Ian Gillen. And Okay, okay. I feel like Well, yeah, I mean I, I didn't so you, you, you think it what do you think? You, you think it's one of their more aggressive, sort of grittier albums, more the most blues rock, electric blues styled albums. Yeah, I, I don't know about their bluesiest, because I still argue I think Killers might be their bluesiest, but Okay, um, okay, but it's but it's among among the, among the blues albums. Yeah, I do think it and it's it approaches uh, <laughs> on like an ACDC type hard blues rock ish at times, especially uh-huh. with "Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter," which is it was supposed to be a Bruce Dickinson solo track for one of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, the fifth one, I think, the oh, really okay. weird one with the baby. Uh huh, <laughs> but. Oh. Yeah, no, I actually think this is a good big step up from Seventh Son. But okay, so I, I wait a B or a B plus. I think a B plus for No Prayer. I do prefer it over Peace of Mind personally, but it is they are it is kind of a different album. Really... It's a bit more dumb. I want to say it's more dumb fun than. I'm going to give it a B, and then we can we can sort of split it between somewhere, but between a b and a b plus yeah and uh because i'm not crazy about this one i do like it but i'm not crazy yeah, i'm about not it. crazy about it and either, i would I, I just think it's just stupidly fun even though it's stupid kind of oh i mean i'm, I'm gonna uh, check it check it out some more because a lot of these uh these episodes we do it's like I don't get around to listening to the music we review and i because i'm like afraid that like i'll have like a new take on it but uh, that's bullshit. I should just re-listen to everything. Um, and then uh, Fear of the Dark is up next, 1992. I like this one a lot. I do think that the title track is kind of the main vocal point, and it is very bookended. Um, it's the last song on the on the album. Yeah. And like you said, wasn't this album? You had to have like a third LP to yeah, just like you know to even listen this to is it. The first one with this with two LPs. So the the marketing, the marketing was fucked up. The merchandising and all that probably this was it probably they probably tried to go with the merchandising on this because it's got a really good album cover. But then like the actual thing you bought was like a disappointing sort of you know like lopsided monstrosity. And then the music. Um, I don't think the music on this album really, um, but be- I think it, what, what they, how do you say, but lies, you know, how, how good the tr- title track is. I think, uh, this is probably like, this is definitely their most inconsistent album. I think. Yeah. It's a really spotty one. And, um, where is it? Where is it recorded? Um, barnyard in essex i'm not oh i yeah, think that yeah. they're some that's, of their best work that barnyard studios in essex the essex, barnyard essex studios isn't really a studio they started recording on no prayer for the dying there it is a barn like a literal barn owned by steve harris oh and they had like hay all over them okay. while they were recording and they were all complaining about that but i think starting with the x factor the next one it would be converted into more of like a real studio 
but we'll get to that. Okay. And yeah, I mean, what, what do you know anything about Music Land where Seventh Son of the Seventh Son was recorded? Um, Seventh Son in Munich. I know it was not recorded in the barnyard. I can tell you that. Um, of a, I, I, well, I'm gonna, I can check just to make sure it was recorded in Music Land in Munich, Germany. Which is different from the yeah. albums before. Yeah, no, yeah, that's. Well, that's what I just said. Is like, do you know anything about Music Land? Oh no, uh, I don't know uh, much about Music Land I mean, actually. Besides, I know, I believe Deep Purple recorded there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a pretty interesting location. I, well, I wonder why they would go to Germany. I guess it's because it's Teutonic and very metallic. All right, so um, where are we at? Uh, Sorry, I'm like actually writing down the recording studio locations for the spreadsheet. That's why I'm I'm sort of blabbing. Um, so what? So, so piece. We back to. I just went back to number all the way the number of the beast. Um, battery. They they recorded at some place called Battery for for Killers and the number of the beast. Oh yeah, Battery. And then what? And then Kingsway was for uh, the debut album. Uh, so. Okay, now somewhere in time had two. Ver- somewhere in time might have. I don't know if this is true. This is. Not, I don't know if this is canon or if. You, and if this might be easily proven wrong, but it seems like uh, our favorite album, "Somewhere in Time," is the only one that was recorded in two separate places. I. Th- um, and they're both very different. I think you're right. They are. <laughs> Yeah, from the Netherlands to the Bahamas, like the la- like the two like the few albums before that, that sure is a jump. Visa Lord, okay, Visa Lord, the Netherlands. Anyway, so um, now that we uh did No Prayer for the Dying, where do you want to rank? Uh, Fear of the Dark, which does have a great song. Like if I played the uh, ask, ask Alexa to play Iron Maiden. They would probably Alexa would play this song at one point because this song is a very popular Iron Maiden it is song. It's huge. Um, it's probably been in a lot of. It's a lot. It's in a lot of movies. It might be the uh, the best introduction song to Iron Maiden for like your girlfriend or someone who just like doesn't really like metal. You know, it's a very like it's a very coy sort of um, alluring song, and it it um it, it's it kind of has a seductive intro. Um, you know, you could say a uh, uh, number of the beasts is like that, but I would say that's a little creepier. This one's a little more uh, settled and and uh, appealing or comforting, right? Cozy. And uh, yeah, so despite the the great aesthetic, um, I think they uh, they shot themselves in the foot by really releasing like a, a second LP with with you know the uh, you know overstuffed material on it. Or whatever you call it, the excess material, and uh, yeah, I mean the album itself, I would give it maybe a C plus. I don't know what do you want. What do you want to go for? Honestly, with it? I think I agree with you on the C plus because I think this album does have some great tracks. I, you said, I like you said the title track. It deserves. I think it deserves a lot of the praise it gets, and the popularity. Um. There's also I th- I really love the opening track be quick or be dead very aggressive, um and they they made a power ballad th- for this album their first power ballad wasting love that I actually really like for some reason it, it it shouldn't work the way it's presented but it does it's stupid catchy I couldn't get it out of my head for weeks after I heard it and now it's back in my head God damn it. Jeez. but yeah i mean i'll have to re-listen to it because i do yeah i yeah uh, hopefully i can get it for for relatively cheap at the at one of the record stores i i peruse because it's it's um it's got you know martin birch on it this is the last one he did and uh it sounds clean and they use the rolling stones mobile studio in that barn which is kind of awesome yeah. Oh wait, no. Maybe they got rid of the studio. Maybe they did no prayer for the dying on in the, with 
what the Rolling Stone mobile studio. But anyway, mm. yeah, I mean, this is a very like interesting time for the band because they're at like kind of peak fame, right? Like they're so famous, they can kind of get away with a lot. They can make a more mediocre album, yeah, this is and then get away with it and still be famous. Kind of them risking. So the I think that kind of bite them in the ass soon. Yeah, they seem to be dicking around with the whole let's go to a barn, like it's like trying to do a Headley Grange recreation. It's a little desperate and um, uh, silly. Yeah. Oh. Um, but I wouldn't say it's an insipid album. I just think it's a little, you know, uh, uh, um, spread thin. Yeah. And okay, up next. I yes. think something I also do want to bring up that there is a song on this album called The Apparition. That would probably be my single pick for least favorite Iron Maiden song. And that's crazy. Because okay. This is not my Noted. least favorite album. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> I got two in particular that I don't it's like. Not my, it's not my least favorite. It's not my least favorite either. I think it, it's probably the best um, uh, um, in, 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 like, you know, for me, it's sort of like. Um, uh like seventh son of a seventh son no prayer for the dying they're they're better than um fear of the dark but i think the best of i think fear of the dark as a song is better than any song from those albums oh yeah i, that I can that. recall i think even be quick or be dead too i think i like better than anything on those two but they, like like we've been saying it's like you can't you do a single you can't make a, 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 a full album out of a single. And they almost made a double album out of this. And you can't make a full album out of a single and get expect to get away with it. But they were at peak fame. So Fear of the Dark did fairly well. Um, all right, up next is The X Factor. Actually, fuck. Okay, I need to, I need to look at the uh, reception, how many how much money did it Bruce get. Bruce Dickinson is gone at this point after Fear of the Dark. It actually got really... Actually, Fear of the Dark got really high on the charts um, for a lot of countries. It was number one in UK, number one, and um, which, which is not super common for Iron Maiden. But it, I think yeah. it, I don't know how many albums have had number I one, but that's not that common. They've had a few more recently. They had number one. They have one sing. They've I think they've only ever had one single to hit number one. That was on No Prayer, the one for Elm Street, be to bring your daughter. Oh okay. But okay. Yeah, yeah. I can see. That. I can understand why. It makes it that's a great that's a great it's actually probably a very that's a very funny association. That's almost like if you could pick a movie series, a film series that was sort of the tie-in to Iron Maiden or was like the Iron Maiden version of a film, it might be a nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Like it just sort of has that comedicness, but it's also spooky or and um popular. Almost yeah, I like, can see it. Uh, maybe I think maybe Bill and Ted 2 could have worked too. Um, that is a, a lot darker. It's like, I know it's like I'm talking about it like so seriously because fucking Bill and Ted, but the second one's a lot darker than the first one. What's the one? What's the one where they like they kill? They found a dead body and they got like, a weekend at Bernie's. Oh, that's weekend at Bernie's. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's what you're thinking. No, I'm of. thinking of Bill and Ted too. That's the one where they die. Go oh, to I don't know. I don't remember the Grim it's Reaper no... and the. Oh and, gosh. Yeah, that one. Um. I totally yes. didn't okay. take any inspiration for that from my own script. <clears throat> um, <laughs> but yeah, that's. I feel like I'm. Anyway, so uh, so we, we've give, we give, we've given this this one album that we didn't rank that high a lot of attention, and um, perhaps we shouldn't. I will say that uh, the peak positions are um, one in UK and then four in Finland, New Zealand. And then it kind of slows down from there. Five in Switzerland, six in France and Norway. Norway. Seven in Italy, eight in Sweden, eight in Austria. Um, did, yeah, I'll just stop did it there. even chart in the U.S. at this point? In the U.S. it was 12. It was I'm 12. I'm surprised it got that high with how the music climate was going. <laughs> it is 1992. I'm not surprised, though, it did exists. really well. But yeah, but I'm not surprised it did well in the UK. I mean, I think it's a very, you know, I think the na the natural spookiness of the tree on the front is sort of um, ind indicative of some sort of English pastoralism. So, yeah, I, I could I could see why the British would particularly like this album yeah. out, out of all made now. 
Um, it does it does sort of have a Halloween feel more so than the other ones did. And anyway, um, up next is the X Factor, which is does not really seem like a Maiden album at first. It's got a strange album cover. Um, its sound is a lot is kind of kind of kind of jarring. I, I I don't dislike it. It's still Maiden. It's still okay, but it just it was not an amazing um, work of art. Yeah, uh, and uh, you, you know I really think. I really think we we could probably say very little about this album, honestly. Truthfully, I think the X Factor is kind of interesting. I think the album cover is not my really? favorite, admittedly. Uh, Hugh Syme did the cover. He did a lot of lots of covers for Rush. Um, okay, and which, that which adds is, up. It's funny because this album, I feel like, is their first. Like they go, this is where their modern style is born on this album um well to an extent this is the music is a little quiet a little paired back blaze bailey is the new vocalist and he's not my favorite but he fits the album um it is a much darker iron maiden album lyrically um very extremely introspective dealing with topics such as post post-traumatic stress disorder um suicide um the loss of faith regaining of it's a very dour album but i think what makes it work in an I, era I, I think i think that is also what makes it work weirdly enough it is an oddly personal album i did know i did hear it was based off of steve harris's personal life at the time as he was going through a divorce and the falling out with Bruce Dickinson that led to him leaving the band. But it went really high in it got really high position in Finland. It got number two, which is the highest it got anywhere. And then number four in Sweden. And then in Italy it got number five. I guess it Iron Maiden's popular there. And um yeah, I, I felt like this album, you know, it's uh it's it's it is kind of like a a gnarly sort of grungy um, maiden attempt. And it's trying to kind of hit on notes that people don't like to talk about, you know, yeah. it's trying to kind of lean into that or reinvent that kind of uh, uh, experience in, in their own, you know, mold. But I just felt like um, they're, they're probably doing a little too much with literature in this, yeah, you know, like something. With Lord of the Flies and, uh, and they, Sign of the Cross, they're trying to seem they're trying to seem intellectual in a time when like a lot of people are doing that, like the mid nineties. Um, like, but but they're not Atlantis Morissette. Like, they don't need to like you know play up their smarts for their people already know that they're a successful mega band. You know, they don't need to. And eventually, they obviously get out of that phase. But I just felt like they they were were trying to play into the the changes of the time a little too much. Um, and obviously the critical reception was not good, kind of uniformly considered a stinker album. Yeah, which is... Um, but I would, I'll, 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 as, as a guy who likes literature, like, you know, and you do too, cause we both were in a screenwriting <laughs> program together. I think this album is worth revisiting just because of all the allusions to like, you know, Edgar Allan Poe or whatever it's got. Um, you know, the name of the rose is a great novel and, you know, I did like, uh, Lord of the Flies and. Apocalypse Now is based on Heart of Darkness, but um, and then uh, Joseph Conrad, right? Yes. But you know, it's apparently according to the trivia, Man on the Edge is based on the movie Falling Down by. Uh, and if you haven't seen Falling fuck? Down, Michael, really? you really, should. you really, you really should. Yeah, yeah I've seen, I've seen, seen Falling it. Down. I didn't, <laughs> I did not get that from Man on the Edge. I know it's it's yeah, the things you learn about these these uh. Let me let me verify that. Oh it, yeah, you're right. I think it. I, it is. <laughs> it is based off of um falling up uh, falling down. Oh, they say. I like how they're just down. They're just falling bu- down. <laughs> oh wow! They say it. They fucking say it. <laughs> oh. Oh, but I'm so okay. So now, can you explain to me a little of the background behind the? Uh, Bruce Dickinson leaving. Oh yeah, so and this Blitz, Blazer, Bailey guy. Uh, Fear of the Dark was a bit of a um, tough period for the band. Bruce Dickinson was starting to get a bit frustrated 
um, with the with the direction they were going in, with Fear of the Dark. Yeah, and a little bit with No Prayer for the Dying, yeah. but especially with Fear of the Dark. Um, and after this album, he would he at this point he had started talking to guitarist Roy Z, and they would end up he would end up being very important for his solo um, career, and. In an attempt to pursue a solo career working with Roy Z, he would decide to leave Iron Maiden. And now in the meantime, however, you know, they did a whole farewell tour. He was allegedly, like, doing a really shit job live, um, which is interesting. But um, after the, his departure, mm. Steve Harris would try um, auditioning other vocalists, Dookie White of... Rainbow was auditioned at one point. Um, I think uh, Michael Kiske of Halloween. I could be wrong about that. I, mean, I think he denied that, actually. Um, and a few others. I feel like I'm missing like a few. Oh, and um, Ralph Sheepers. No, 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 no. That was you know, Ralph Sheepers of Primal Fear and Gamma Ray. I think tried for Iron Maiden and eventually Judas Priest at one point. But um, eventually he they okay. went with Blaze Bailey of Wolf Spain, which opened for Maiden. And yeah. okay, and do do you know anything about what he's doing now? Because he's obviously not an Iron Maiden. Oh anymore. yeah, so Blaze Bailey. Yeah, we'll get to his. He has he only has one more album with the band after this, and we'll get to that one because there's a few issues surrounding that one. But like, okay, let's so let's rate the oh, X yeah. Factor. I'll get to the Blaze Bailey stuff. Release on honestly, I think B. Second October, nineteen ninety-five. B. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's a safe, kind of a safe play. I would go with B minus. I think this is a, you know, I. I it's mean, a little hard to listen to sometimes. For me. Um. Heck, I'll, I'll do C plus. If I did Fear of the Dark, C plus, I'll probably do this one C plus. I think this is at least better than Fear of the Dark, personally, just because like. You know, it is... I'll do B-minus. It has more grit. Yeah. It does have the grit. And I don't think... Um, I, I think besides No Prayer for the Dying, which does feel a little bit like a relic of the... Like, they're still in a bit of an 80s sound. Of their, like, true 90s albums, this is probably the best of the three. Between this, Fear of the Dark, and the next one. Okay, so you're giving it a B or B-minus? B-minus. Still, which all right, the next one. Okay, uh, hey man, this is where our taste may differ because I listened to this one and I know it doesn't sound like typical maiden at all, it's really off. But I liked it, I was like kind of into it. But probably, I was um, virtual 11, virtual 11, 1998. I was into it, and I maybe maybe I'm just weird, but I was like, oh, this this album is like special. Um, I thought it was special, I think. And so, what's your take? This is um, a bit of an interesting album, because on one hand, I feel like this album peaks really, really high. Like, um, Future Real, okay, I think it's a great winner enough. of The Klansman, is amazing. If slightly okay. repetitive, Como Estais Amigos is beautiful. Um, the Educated Fool, I think, works really well, too. That one's a bit more, again, trying to be intellectual, but, um, but I, I think that one's very strong. But then on the other hand, we got stuff like, like, Don't Look to the Eyes of a Stranger, which is like eight minutes of bullshit. <laughs> and The Angel and the Gambler is really weird. It's just weird horn sounds in the background, and the same chorus repeated like five million fucking times over and over again it's very lop it's very inconsistent like fear of the dark but i think it's better if that makes any sense it's very sure weird album. yeah um i would i would give it a b plus or an a minus and uh there's not a lot to say about it which is kind of funny because I feel like with a lot of these albums, there's ton, a ton to say. There's a ton that's been researched. There's a ton of, you know, sort of trivia out there. 
Um, it just, it's, it's so it, it's all integral to the history of the the main lineup of the band. Um, there's a lot of stories revolving around you know episodes in the production of these albums, the touring. But with this one, I I can safely say I don't really care about the, the touring. I don't really care about how it was made. I just kind of like listening to it, and that's that is that is a breath of fresh air. Because um, I it, it makes my job easier where I don't have to like re- review sort of the the uh, pre-production and post-production aspects. You know, I can just look at or just sort of the album. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear me again? Where did I cut off? Where did I cut off for you? You, you said album. Okay, well, so I, uh, yeah, this, this album, you know, it's, um, I, I did I say, I, I told you I, I like that it, there's not a lot of fuss about it. Like I said that, yeah. kind of. It's a bit no Yeah, frills. I like that there's not, it's a no frills. There's not a lot of, like, spectacle. There's not a lot of, um, whispering through the grapevine it's not like a rumored up album it's not high publicity it's not uh there's not a bunch of stories revolving around you know personnel you know disputes or you know legendary sort of like wild uh, um, moments in the band's history revolving around this album i'd like that this album is kind of like a nothing album a throwaway but at the same time i really enjoy listening to it and that's kind of like unusual, you know. You don't get that a lot with uh, with with Iron Maiden. Um, and maybe you'll start to get some more because they're, the, the bandmates are getting older, and they're just kind of getting less interesting in that that kind of you know dramatic kind of um, interpersonal rivalry kind of way. Mm-hmm. But I, I still think that this album is uh, um is sort of a sort of like you know an underrated one, and um, I would give it a B plus. I think I'm going to give it something like a mid B, I think. Because I think this okay. album is like I do I don't think it's quite as consistent as the X Factor personally. But I do I I enjoy this album. I think it's a good listen front to back. It's a lot shorter than Fear of the Dark and the X Factor and that leads to a punchier experience as a whole. But by the way, it is the fourth one they recorded at the Barnyard. Yeah. Which marks it as as the main that makes the barnyard um the 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 one that they recorded this at this point in time this would have been the uh, recording studio they've used the most yeah. for all these albums and it wouldn't last much longer because they've used it four four times this is their last time they used it oh well this is the this is it is it is the mode for their usage but yeah. i guess not any longer this is their 90s um, this is their 90s studio Really? Yeah, let's look at it. Yeah. All the 90s. They did it in the barnyard. That's crazy. Um, And honestly, those 90s albums, uh, they, they, you'd think that they would be total doggerel, um, horse shit, but they are pretty good. Like, they're just, for Maiden, they're not great, but they are pretty good. Um, And then up next is uh, Brave New World. I'll do us, Huxley. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Any other band, they would be like a mate. They would be the creme de la creme. Um, anyway, so Brave New World is a, is a is a hilarious Aldous Huxley reference, and they also got some songs or like Out of the Silent Planet, some great literature references in this one. Um, definitely like they're kind of moving up in terms of the educated sort of liter- literati that they try to appeal to, but I think the the music was not awesome in this. I um. When I when I listened to this and re-listened to it, I felt like it could have been. The critics liked it more than the last album. Like the critics liked this one a little bit more than some of the other ones, but I feel like this one almost was like not good at all. Or uh, unless I'm confusing it with, unless I'm confusing it with um. The final frontier. I might you you know I'm I'm probably thinking of the final frontier. You know this one this one's actually okay. This one. I find kind of interesting because it's almost like a transitional album because on one hand 
during while they were they were writing this album as a follow up to Virtual Eleven, and they were using like a lot of a lot of like similar songwriting. Uh, it's it is very similar to Virtual Eleven in a lot of ways. But then while they were writing this album, they were also on tour with Blaze Bailey. He was having lots of vocal problems, anger issues on stage. Um, there's a interesting clip about him calling out someone like fucking kill him, kill him like that. It's kind of insane, but eventually Blaze Bailey was let go from the band. And uh, who came back? Eric but... Riggs did this. Oh, he did this? Did the art, though. Oh, he did. He did, he did the thing. Well, call me wrong. This yeah, was... Yeah. So, okay. No Prayer for the Dying was not the last one. I... Okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, but who would they get back? But Adrian Smith. Um on top of Yannick Gers and Dave Murray as three guitarists and Bruce Dickinson back. And this is the lineup that persists to this day. And Kevin Shirley as the producer. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty great um, return to form. I don't think it's like my top, one of my top albums for them, but it's 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 an, it's an, uh, a curiosity because you're like you said, it's transitional. It's a little... Um, it's got a little flavor. It's got flavors of the old mixed with the new. It feels like you're kind of the technology is changing almost as much as like the music is, and I, I just think it's a it's an interesting sort of medley of of of, of experiences. And, it, and at the, but at the same time, I think that's also because it's sort of blur. What makes it blur together for me? It's not the most cohesive. Yeah, um, it's, but I like it. it. Really, the album really doesn't. I like it, but I don't yeah. love it. You know, it doesn't really have 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 a super have a real structure to it. It's sort of all over the place. It's good, but it's not impressive. That okay? No, no, yeah. Well, what's be what's here, what's here? Would you put it in? So I would say I'd give it a B. I agree. I think it's more or less on the same level as the last two. I think maybe a little better. I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> They're very similar. They these this and Virtual Eleven blur together a little bit for me, admittedly. But that would end with the next what, album. What, what, what you, that's 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 true for me. I mean, the, there's only, only so much like you know edgy you know guitar um, staccato kind of writ, like like lines you can do, and then have it feel like you know like 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 something that's actually symphonic. Like it really it really kind of loses its like its um it's operatic value when you're just like, you're just like throwing in guitar fills like left and right. And it, it, it almost, it's almost like you have to really like zoom in or in microscope down on like this, on like this, on the tracks to actually get like anything out of it. Like you can't really listen to it casually. You have to really take it way too seriously. Um, but that's, that's kind of what makes it impressive despite not being a very, uh, commercially popular album. Yeah. So, um, uh, okay, well, you gave it a B or B minus or B plus? B, just flat B, I think. B. Brave, New, Brave New World, the year two thousand, right? That's their, you know, big en- big entry to the next millennium, yeah. and uh, just a B. I will say though, that kind I, of flat. Yeah, on a side note, I do like, I, I do enjoy Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, so, you know, I don't know. Yeah, there's there's that sort of guilty pleasure aspect where you're like, oh, I'll listen to it because of the <laughs> name. Look, they made the, and then you find that they made the book song. <laughs> by the way, I think that this one, um, a little bit lame compared to Virtual Eleven for me, and um, and then obviously Dance of Death, I think is a bit better than Brave New World. So, oh, I can't um, wait to talk about this album. This is one of my favorites. I think. Their thirteenth album released in twenty uh, two thousand three, and it's uh, it was recorded. Sam West released in late two thousand three in sep- early September. I I think this album is kind of ki- kind of killer. Like it kind of it kind of has a good vibe, and it's uh it, it's always obviously been higher rated by critics than the ones in the nineties were. Um, so this is more of like a real return to form in a sense. Although I doubt that you could really ever say that about Maiden, except for maybe way later. But yeah, for a 2003 album, this one's really good. Um, I would give it an A minus. This album 
fucks. <laughs> this album, there's so much about this album that I love. It feels fresh and yet familiar at the same time in ways that I haven't felt since somewhere in time. And I'm not calling it as good as that album because I don't think that, that is, as stated before, that is my favorite album. But Dance of Death is, I think it's brilliant. There are no bad songs on the album. Yes, it does get a little long, but trust me, that'll be a bigger problem for later albums. And I, my favorite song on this album is probably Passchendaele. Um, or Montsegur, maybe. Okay. Right. Okay. But okay. I think uh, Nico McBrain does an excellent job on this album. He has a bit of like a heavier sound to his drums. I want to say he has his one and only songwriting credit with New Frontier, which I think is about cloning and the ethics of cloning. Mm-hmm. Um. Ah. Uh, yeah. I just okay. honestly, this is this is probably be one of the first albums I recommend to for people to get started with Iron Maiden, weirdly enough. If you want modern Iron Maiden, right, this is right, probably right. my favorite since the reunion. And I think an I think a high I, I don't I think an S personally, but I could deal with an A. I'll do it. I'm doing A. What, what, what's your final I think I, I grade. I think I could I'll I can compromise with like a high or like an A or an A plus, I think. But A plus for you. This is this is not like a killer situation where it's so close but held back by a song. Like this is like really hard. <laughs> it's a it's a cool album, and I'm 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 I was really glad to find it when I when I started listening to With it. All that being anyway, uh said, um despite my love for the Grim Reaper as an aesthetic what the actual fuck is that album cover? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's cer- certainly macabre. It's certainly, uh, um, a cover. But also, it looks like a, it looks like a disco, like um, you know. Oh, it's like a sex orgy for like elitist, for like uh, elitist CGI uh, you know, it's demons. Like... Yeah, it's like a. It's also like the masquerade it, uh, and, the, and the rich people orgies. Yeah, and I'm, it's yeah the yeah well, it's eyes wide as shut. As per usual, no. rich people and anyway. like Grim Reaper. Maybe a little bit too much. Yeah, it makes my blood boil just thinking about yeah. it. All right. Anyway, um, well, you know, <laughs> um, up next is a uh, matter of life and death, 2006. So they're taking more time off between albums. Still, this one is. Done at Sarm West, and uh, Kevin Shirley's the producer on these. Yeah, he's been producing since and... Brand New World, and you know, actually, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put air yeah. quotes around producing because starting from this album on, he would basically just provide some consultation. Otherwise, these albums are basically recorded live. They're almost like glorified jam sessions from here on out until like oh, Sinjutsu. Wow. Like, Sinjutsu's, like, the one that broke that trend. But these next three were basically recorded live in a studio, like, without much changing of the knobs or even keyboard interference. Funny. Um, that's that's really impressive. I guess their sound is just that tight. I, uh, yeah, what did you think of A Matter of Life and Death? I, I dig the album cover... I was trying to trying to enjoy it, and I kind of felt like I had to like, you know, spend some more time with it than I did. It, it, it's not a really um, vivid album. It's kind of it, it kind of blurs together. It's kind of gravelly in a sense. It's 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 sort of a, it doesn't have the cohesion the classic albums had. It's not a return to form in any readily identifiable way. Um, I guess if you just sort of microscopically listen to the different sections of each song you might find some really cool stuff but for me it was kind of um like a passing fancy i i don't know like if i'd listen to it like you know real soon what'd you think i think this is my least favorite no not least favorite this is my least definitely not my least favorite no way i'll get to that this is my least listened to iron maiden album i think and 
I think the reason for that is just because it's a very heavy-handed album. I think this is a very much of a war atrocities album. Um, a lot of, right, and I or like you know the act of war is like a sort of a soft theme for this album, but I think. You know, I just I feel like this album kind of peaks a little too early. I, I its first two songs are probably the best it gets, and maybe there's a song called "Out of the Shadows" that I like and "The Longest Day," but you know, I don't know. It's just I think this there is such a thing as being too cohesive, and this album kind of suffers. From I that. think it's a little little preach a little a little on the nose, a little too preachy. Yeah. It's kind of like. If they're, if they're covering topics that are kind of near and dear to people's yeah, hearts, this might be like the, it's a little... Uh, this might be like the only time in Modern uh, Maiden, of like the post-reunion Iron Maiden. Number one, by the way, by the way, number one in five countries. What? Yeah. Uh, Sweden, Poland, Italy, and uh, Germany and Finland. I'm kind of wild. And number two in, in 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 Norway, Canada, Hungary. So they're they're getting higher on the charts, as, even though they're out, when they're even though their albums aren't as good, they're higher on the charts. It's kind oh, of funny. Another interesting thing before we get to the <laughs> ranking is that for the tour for this album, they refused to play older Maiden songs and other more fan favorite Maiden songs in favor of playing this album from beginning to end in order. Like, they wouldn't play, like... Okay. Yeah, it's a little... They were... I'm gonna admit, that this album is a little pretentious, I think. But not a bad one. I think it's still good. It's better than Fear the Dark. Yeah, let me, um... Uh, what, what, what would you give it, a B-? I think a B-. minus. Probably, I think, the lowest album that I'd put in B. That I'd not put in C, I'd say. The lowest album, I, the the worst album that I that I would not put in C. Okay, so I'll give it a B minus minus. Um, heck, let's just give it a let's give it a C plus. Hey, you know, fuck it, yeah. It's just it's there's some good stuff on here. It's just I, you know, I just don't care. <laughs> yeah, that, that's how I kind of feel. It's like, is it really worth finding out about? Um, but you know, um, I mean, that's a lot of people's music. So again, again, a C plus for Iron Maiden is a lot better than a C plus for for yeah, me. A C plus for yeah. Iron Maiden is like an, it's like an A for for anyone yeah. else. Yeah. Well, I mean, not for okay. anyone, anyone else, but just for like, yeah, there's a lot of people wouldn't be an A for, but like it's an A for a lot of amateurs, you know, out there. C- like most a people. A C tier for Judas Priest is probably worse than a C tier for Iron Maiden. Yeah, I could see that. Because well, I well, that's because their their music is really kind of kind of good. Yeah. Um, Demolition. You know, once it gets down to it's just C, it drops off a lot. Um, it, it starts it starts to become like sort of nasty. Yeah. You know, uh, Iron Maiden doesn't really get. Iron Maiden is never like a nasty sounding group. They just sort of lose cohesion. It blurs together. They become kind of kind of gutter punky all of a sudden. It just loses kind of cohesion, yeah. and it, it stops being metal. becomes more in the punk orientation, which is not what the fan base really wants, and it never really sounds that all that great. And I, I, I um, think in their case, I think that's the reason why they made a bit of a stylistic change for the next album. The next one has a really cool album yet again. Um, I wonder if it was the same dude who did the art, Derek Riggs. Can you look uh, up if he did the art? Yeah, I, Derek Riggs did. It. Oh, and they recorded, and they recorded at Compass Point again. Yes, all the good. Oh, I love it. Compass Point. <laughs> it's actually not strictly true. Okay, not strictly. Yeah, but I'm, them. you know, <laughs> Compass Point's usually a good thing. This what album sounds first, great. What was it? And then, but then they also did one in the in Malibu, and that's in L.A. And I don't see Iron Maiden as a, as a, a group that needs to record in L.A. It just doesn't oh, make sense. So the cover for um, L.A. Um, a Matter of Life and Death is made by a guy named Tim Bradstreet and Grant sure. Olish. Well, what about the Final Frontier? Oh, but that's what that's what I'm talking about. Constantine and Black Panther comics, the artist for M- A Matter of Life. Oh, and okay. Death. 
for the final friends here the cover was done by let's see um melvin grant he did fear of the dark and virtual 11 of the dark okay he's pretty good i say his artwork's pretty good because this is yeah. a, a really cool album cover however i think uh did. listening to this music though i didn't love it and i think it, it's like fear of the dark where it's like it's got an aspect or two that's like brilliant but then overall it's sort of a bummer or just like some a solid letdown and uh i i want to say uh the final frontier you know it got good ratings um but unless I'm mistaking it with Brave New World, I felt like the Final Frontier was kind of a, a whatever album, and it, it didn't have a lot of uh, um, meaningfulness. Like the if you look at the track listing, the tracks are have nothing to do with space exploration for the most There's, part. They have I think one. Uh, song. I mean only obliquely. <laughs> Coming home, yeah, some of them might obliquely be about that, but blatantly only the Final Frontier Satellite 15, whatever you call it. So So um it, Yeah, it's it was they call it bar, bombasting and grading, that's what the Guardian said. And I, I I tend to agree with that. And that's like often the criticism for, for Maiden, but for this one I I remember it's particularly standing out as sort of um abusive uh so yeah what 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 else can you do um i would give it a c plus i'll give it a c i think i th if, unless i'm unless i'm confusing it with a different album i'd give it a c i think this album is honest i think this album is better than a matter of life and death personally i think a good bit okay. um and i think the reason okay. for that is just because i think it just sounds a bit to me I think most of the album sounds a bit more fresh, even though it's definitely not a perfect album. Um, I like the title track is it gets a bit pr very progressive. It's probably their most progressive metal album, I'd say. Um, the Talisman is probably Talisman's of one of many epics on this album. The Talisman and Isle of Avalon are probably my two favorite songs off the album. They are. You know your base, your your you know your sort of Iron Maiden stamp of oh, stamp of approval, epics on the album. But at, at the same time, I think they went a little overboard. And granted, the this these albums will get longer. This okay. is the last one that they that wasn't a double CD. <laughs> so, you know, I think that this one is. Just really self-indulgent. Yeah. Um, even if it's got some good moving parts, it's sort of fluid machine. I think it's really self-indulgent. For me, that's a big no-no. I would say it has to be a C plus out of principle. But I mean, I, I mean, you know, mileage kind of varies. Like depending on my mood, I might like it more. I might say a B. But I just think um, based on the way it's been, the way the let like it, it has a lot of promise and it doesn't it breaks its promise. It doesn't deliver. Yeah, it, so for me, it's just a let album. I think it's either it's either very swashbuckling or very still, if that makes any sense. Like nowhere really in between. Yeah. Um, to reference yeah. the Black Sabbath song, "All Moving Parts Stand Still." <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a contradictory it's theme. It's a contradiction in its themes. Uh, I don't know. What do you, you want to give it a? Uh, you can give it a different grade than I. Honestly, what do you give it? I, I think it's a lower B, personally. Okay, B minus, and then we'll settle on. Oh, what's what's in between a B minus and a C plus? Shit. Consensus. Um, hmm. So this is the only one I can't actually type in. So I'll just say. Uh, C plus slash B minus. Kind of like a okay. Emo. Somewhere I don't know. Yeah. And then and then, this is actually you know this, and this is a fairly recent album. It's the third to last, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it is kind of it is kind of a major insult to trash this album. I get it, but I just didn't. I wasn't crazy about it. 
it's 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 try it's playing it too too close to the chest you know it's like trying to be cutesy and stuff and i just with the with the that like that alien doesn't even look scary you know it looks more cool it's like i don't even wish than scary or so like they i think i think you know i like the color scheme on this one i'm just not crazy about the alien eddie design um yeah you know it's just it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of flipped itself upside down, hasn't it? Um, uh, anyway, the next one, the Book of Souls, is a maybe goes in the other direction, right? It's a lot. It's whatever like cutesy ghoulishness that Final Frontier was doing. The Book of Souls tries to be even more like grim and like self-important and like uh, you know erudite. I think this album is um, a little bit of a sad story because it was um, available digital download and you could only buy it at Best Buy on CD and it's got certain like qualities that are sort of you know show you that the market isn't really you know what it once was. But I actually think that the artistic merit of this album is higher than in the Final Frontier. So the Book of Souls is. Um, a cool addition to the Maiden catalog. I also like to point out that it's the first one that was done by Parlophone and after they split with EMI. And it also has their longest song on record at 18 minutes in length with Empire of the Clouds. So this album is, is definitely a big change-up. Um, at least I think so. And it was recorded in Paris at Guillaume Tell which is the same location as Brave New World. So the Book of Souls, a fairly interesting um, stab in the dark with all the, all, all the change-ups they're doing. Um, also, they had, a, they had some cover artwork that was Mayan-themed, which is um, not something they had done before. Uh, so what do you, what, what's your take on the whole thing? Do you, do, you, uh, do you like this album, or do you think it's you know just one for the... For the dregs. So, um, this album is a bit of a sad backstory. Before I get into the thing itself, there is a lot there. I do have to recognize that there was a lot going on with this album was making. Bruce Dickinson got throat cancer. Or, yeah, got throat oh. cancer during the making of this album. And he did manage to beat it, which is fucking amazing. Um, but, and, you know, the fact that his performance on here does reflect a bit of that recovery, but is, but he still manages to power through. It's fucking Bruce Dickinson. Um, but, you know, there was that, um, the band had also taken an extended time off between this and the Final Frontier. Um, and they were trying a few new different things. There are three epics on this album. This is their longest album by a good long shot. Um, it's the first on two CD. The first be distributed across two CDs, three vinyls, um, and again, Empire of the Clouds. I actually think there's a lot of very piano driven, very very experimental for Iron Maiden, and I recognize that there's a lot to respect about this album, and lyrically too. There's they made a song on Robin Williams, um, but to be totally honest. Huh. This is my least favorite Iron Maiden album, and I yeah. don't even think it's close. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I and don't hate it. I don't why, is, really. why is that? I don't even think it's bad, even. But okay. it's just... You think it's just, it, it's just sort of it awkward? It's really uneventful, outside of, like... I, I love the opening track. Um... If Eternity Should Fail and Speed of Light, I think a really energetic opening track. They're kind of like classic Maiden for the first time in a long time. Um, and then it just sort of dies for most of the album. Like it's very just sort of background music almost. And Maiden is not supposed to be background music. <laughs> but. By the way, it was a number one. It was a number one. Um, in a lot of countries. Oh, yeah, financially, I think like financially and pu like publicly, this is one of their most successful albums. But I think this is like the moment it where I, I just feel like 
until like it's basically like these first two albums and then it's basically like first two songs i mean then a long just sort of wasteland of just very uninteresting songs that just kind of a bore to sit through and then we get to tears of a clown which is a really sad song about robin williams after his passing and I, you know i connect to that song a lot personally because i i fucking i loved robin williams and um he's part of the class. I, 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 he's from my area Rob Williams, uh, you know, he lives in my area. He lives around here, and in, in Marin. And he, uh, I, I knew someone who's like family friends with that with the Williams family, and they go and hang out with him all the time. It was really, and apparently he was like a really humble dude. Like in real life, like he would, you know, he would like, you know, I mean, people would see him in town all the time, and he was very chill. But like even behind closed doors, he was really humble, and he would like the kids would be playing video games and stuff, and he would like stop at dinner to like hang out and play video games with them and shit like and like how many dads do that you know what i mean and he was he would get all into it and you're just apparently you're just like sitting there with your friend and then his friend's dad is robin williams and you're just playing video games for like you know that's a really kind of crazy um kind of personality to have to you know that for a celebrity i think but yeah i don't know i uh i don't know uh when he died it was weird because he he is like a local kind of icon, and then when he died, it was like not a lot of people left who were like super famous like that. There's 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 some, but he was definitely the most famous person who, from Marin. Um, and uh, a lot of people have stories about him because he would go to the local comedy shows all the time. But yeah, it. it uh, what, what's the song called? The Tears of a Clown. Yeah. I'll have to check that one out. I. Uh, yeah, I think regardless of everything and my personal attachment to certain songs, like I, I just never got into the whole thing. Uh, it's very, it's too much. This album, a lot too much, empty space. On this, like I think if this could have been great as a, like a standard length single LP length album. And then just kept like all, like a lot of like the stronger songs and maybe throw in Empire of the Clouds too. And they probably could have truncated it, yeah. right? And you know, it would it would have been even better, I guess. But I, I I like this idea that it's more of like a it's more of a compendium than just like you know a few short ditties that go by in like twenty minutes. But yeah, I I, I would say that this album definitely doesn't feel at. Uh, at immediately like a iron maiden kind of album it feels a little off but um that's sort of sometimes you know that that variety is the spice of life kind of thing anyway so uh what what would you grade it for? what's your grade for it and also um remind me how many albums back kevin shirley was the producer and can you remind me um when uh, what's his name started um martin Martin, what's his name? Oh, Martin Birch started on Killers in 1981 and went until Fear of the Dark in 1992. Um, Shirley is okay. technically their longest serving producer. He's been on, he started on Brave New World and is still their producer. Which, okay, okay. You know. And, He's the longest serving in temporally, but, but uh, uh, you know. Disco discographically, he's not because, right? Yeah, discographically, he's not as prolific as Martin Birch, but in terms of like time, technically, yeah. All right, we, I mean, that, that also says something, but it's I just don't know if it's as quite as impressive. Um, Brave New World, Kevin Shirley, okay, and who did you know who did the X Factor virtual? Eleven. Steve Harris. And who did Iron Maiden? The first? Steve Harris himself did it. Run. It uh the, the first one or, or, did, or uh for X Factor and Virtual Eleven, Steve Harris did it himself. Okay. And and then for the debut Iron Maiden, who did? Sir. What? Who was producer for the debut album? Uh, I don't remember the name. It's he was a uh, big. New Wave of British Heavy Metal producer. 
um, iron. Okay, well, 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 I'll look it up right now. Um, anyway, so for your, how do you grade Will Malone? Uh, Will Malone he also okay. worked with Black Sabbath. Interestingly, I did not know that. I don't know on what. Um, he worked on. Huh. He worked on Sabotage. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. But he, I don't think he... Will Malone. The, he worked as the choir yeah. arrangement for songs for, I believe, Megalomania and Superstar. <laughs> However you fucking pronounce that. Super. He's worked with so many different artists. Wow, like the D- Deepesh Mode, The Verb, Todd Rundgren, Massive Attack. Yeah. Okay, well... Gianna Nannini. Anyway, so let's. Uh, what, how do you grade uh, the Book of Souls? What's your grade? I'll, well, I'll try to find one that we can. Work C with. minus. Uh, C minus. Okay, I will give it a B minus, and then we can compromise. C. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and that one's for a final album. Hello? Will Malone. Oh, yeah. Yes, final album. Oh, and this one's actually a pretty cool one. I, I always like this one. And I think this one's higher than the Book of Souls. I definitely agree. Uh, which is Senjutsu. Uh, obviously the first one to really go blatantly into a um, non-Western you know, society for its inspiration. Uh, and I think they, I think they pulled it off. I think they aced it. Japan. If there's any country that's like, you know, can like sort of have a sort of feudal credibility similar to Christendom in the West, it's probably Japan. And so I really like the the way this album focuses on the warrior cast. Uh, what do they call it? Not the samurai cast, but there's a word for the samurai warrior cast. Really focuses in on that. It's got great um, thematic changes. They're pretty subtle. Uh, it's it's certainly not my least favorite album. Um, I think uh, it's a really really cool album. The only problem is is that the music itself is just not at the level that it used to be. But and the, and Bruce's singing isn't as good because he's had throat cancer and all this and that. But something about this album just makes me want to like it, and um, I don't think I could dog it by giving it like a C. I think I have to give it a B something, um, maybe an A minus, because it because it does have really cool um, topics. But I just I think it's I think it's a well written album, but the music itself I just I'm not in love with it. I think I think what's I think this album being their newest does. I think you'd think that it, I'd be the least familiar with it, but I, I think I'm, I feel more connected to it than I did Book of Souls or something like that. And as, as, right. a, res, I think so. as a result, um, I actually think this is probably their best since Sense of Death. Um, I think that there are maybe like a few weaker moments on the later songs, like the yeah, parchment. That's and Death of the Celts, which is a blatant ripoff of themselves with the Klansmen. I mean, it's it's their best, and like it's their you know you're saying it like it's nothing, but that's what it's like twenty years. It's like their best one in twenty yeah, years, it's almost their best eighteen one years since two thousand three. And I'll it's been out for over five years now, or no, no, not five years, two, um, two years. What am I saying? It's been out. I remember ago. the day it came out. Yeah, actually, it's... I was really excited for this. Where where were you, where could you get it? Was it only online, or was that like store like or like a know, radio show? Uh, Circuit City. Where you they sold it? it? They there it was on the digital shelves, but they also sold it on CD and on vinyl. I managed to pick up a vinyl record copy from Newberry um, on release day. Oh, what's Newberry? It's a comic. It's a a comic chain that they also sell records and occasionally merchandise and DVDs. They're they're like Hot Topic, but way less edgy. If that makes any sense. Oh, okay. 
Never heard of it. Funny. Um, New England. Okay, fair enough. Okay, well, well at any rate, uh, this one is... Um, I think it's information. That's why. Uh, oh, and there's also like a few songs of sound that I think are like, I, to me, they're almost like instant classics. Like there's a few on this album. Like, um, I feel like Days of Future Past and Hell on Earth, the closing epic. Hell on Earth is like it's some okay. End. The writing on the wall. The writing on the wall has. An I've listened to this a lot, but I don't remember the track very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I have listened to this one a fair amount because it, it, it's it's all it's on the algorithm a bunch. He just it just it's like recommended all the time. And it, uh, so I would give it just a, a straight B. I think it's um, it's kind of a middle of the road experience, but it is it is a really cool idea that Iron Maiden can pump out an album of this caliber so late in the game. Really, it's really impressive for how long they've been doing it. I think it's a B plus, or maybe an A minus. Okay. Personally. Okay, you're saying B. I'll, I'll give it a B plus then, and then we can compromise to B B plus because you, you're probably going A minus. Uh, or I'll give you an A. Uh, yeah, and then it'll just stay B plus. All right. B plus for Senjutsu. Uh, that's everything. And it was the first album. It was the first album in six years. Yeah, we did. Two singles: "The Writing on the Wall" and "Strategic Stratego," which is like a yeah, board game. It's off the kind board of funny. game. <laughs> These guys—they're getting so lazy with their references, but I think that's kind of why they're successful. Actually, is because it's like really like you know, it's like really like obvious sort of uh, cultural you know hallmarks. Yeah. Uh, the writing of the wall. And is so, a uh, video, fully animated. Okay, I'll have to uh, check that out. Uh, yeah, so um, let's let's tally it up. We did all the, you know, almost 20 albums. So it's 17. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Sorry. Uh, what is it? Yeah, 17 albums. And then almost in the 80s, you had one almost every year until 1985 when there was no album released. And then 86, they did almost every two years. 86, 88, 90, 92. And then after Fear of the Dark, they didn't do it really that consistently. It was 95. And then every four. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, well, it went every three years. 95, 98, 2000, which was early. But then 2003, 2006. And then 2010, which was four. And then five. But then it was 2015, five. And then... 2021 which is six yeah and then they so have plans to record a new album but i think that's only rumors and whispers at this point if they do they'd probably have to hire a new drummer which considering nico's attachment to the band and their attachment to nico and i don't think that's gonna happen so there's a very real chance that sinjutsu could be their last There's a yeah, very strong possibility that they, they, they're, the band won't even sound anything like its former self if they do change. So yeah, I um, I uh, I uh, I, I hate to say it, but we got kind of all these albums discussed, and they're kind of it's kind of the end of the era for them, isn't it? I mean, there's been many eras for Iron Maiden, but the overall super era. Is kind of at a close with Nika's uh, par- paralysis. Yeah. So we're kind of looking back at every you know incremental moment in their studio um, legacy. Uh, and um, I think you know, what do you think? Uh, there's we we ranked three albums around C. You gave one a B, Final Frontier a B minus. I gave a C plus. So I guess two or three for C. Um, a lot were in the B area, and we were pretty careful about where we put them. When we put one in S, somewhere in time, and then we we placed th- three, four more in A. Um, so four, five in A and S. I have, which is not great. It's yeah. I mean, it's it's not great for, but it, when you look at it, but in just think, in context of other bands and other acts. A C for Maiden 
is, I mean, you know, we said it before. And regardless, though. Yeah, like their, ver- their version of C is, is um, it w- w- would win certain artists that we're not going to name. We'll probably win them like a Grammy. You yeah. Know? So. I mean, Iron Maiden won Grammys uh, off, the, off the Final Frontier. I think it's their only. Did it really win for the album. final I could be wrong about that. Oh well, now I now I like it a little more. You know? But I can't. I, I don't. I don't want to call them sellouts because I don't think the Grammys work that way. But I don't. I don't. I just don't like the Final Frontier that much. I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll revisit it soon. Anyway, let's wrap it up. Um, this is a great tradition. The Iron Maiden uh, uh, extravaganza. All seventeen albums currently released ranked. Studio galore, uh, you know, one of the finest bands in heavy metal history. Um, I I can't believe it's already done. You know, it's what we did. How much? How much did we do for time? Two hours. Yeah, two hours and six minutes. It's looking like maybe a little. No, it's two hours almost. I'm at that. Almost two hours. It's pretty great. And um, I will say that I was surprised by. Seventh Son of a Seventh Son being in 1988. I always thought that was a 90s album. It's really, it really still surprises me. Like I thought, Fear of the Dark followed somewhere in time, and then Seventh Son and No Prayer for the Dying were after that. So my my chronology on this was was not as intuitive as I thought it would be. But beyond that, I'm impressed by how many Martin Birch albums are, and Kevin Shirley, of course, and it, EMI was kind of footed the bill the whole way through but the parlophone albums really really had a different emphasis which is kind of kind of awesome um don't know what else to say uh what let's find out what their highest selling album is and then close out from there um let's find out are we adjusting for inflation or uh we don't have to um, oh yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. It's number of the beast, I believe. Could be wrong. Number of the One units. Bestsellingalbums.org. Very on the n- number of the beast. Okay. Yeah, number of the beast. Then peace of mind, and the live album live after death. I should have seen that coming. <laughs> what about made in London or made in Japan? I like those ones. Made in England. No, made in Power England. Slave. How Power Slave? Nine million. Peace of Mind. Twelve point four five. Number of the Beast. Eighteen point eight two. Damn. Their lowest selling wow. studio right. album is, but not counting any singles or EPs or live albums, is definitely by far Virtual Eleven. That's their lowest yeah, one, the least selling. Wow, man! And even even that one, we were we were actually favorable. You know, we were like that one's pretty good. Yeah, just at that point, so, I wouldn't really care. And Blaze Bailey's not being the most reliable live. Like shows had to be canceled because of, I believe, allergic reactions to something that really hurt his voice. And okay. the fact that the rest of the band went to what? down the songs to. Um, keep in his range, which maybe that should just say something that I, oh yeah, you know what? Let me bring this up too, because I do want to at least look a little bit into like, before we go, um, in terms of like aftermath of, because there aren't that many departed members from Iron Maiden, like the ones that left or were fired. I did talk about Dennis Stratton before, so I'll cut him, but, um, Clive Burr, after he, I think he was either left or fired after Number of the Beast. And he worked with, he made a group with members of Praying Mantis. I keep bringing them up. Um, joined them for a few times on live shows. and But then eventually, I believe, contracted something and passed away. Rest in peace. He's an amazing drummer. Ooh. Oh, the, uh, the 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 interim drummer for Maiden, Clive. Clive? Yeah. Clive okay. Yeah, that, that, that is unfortunate. I had no idea. Paul Diano um, has a solo, has a, has a long-standing solo career. Some of his stuff is a little patchy, but there's stuff like the band Killers, 
from the 90s killer it's so cool it's so cool all the connections to this incredible group yeah. and it's like this is such a world world-class band it's like you know there's uh, there's never going to be another band like that it's a serious one-of-a-kind act oh, and, and uh really popular i was looking at some trivia too yeah they're all they're very popular all over definitely yeah, in europe yeah. and uh, in japan too. All, all over the western civilization and the uh the funny uh, south america they love in south you know south america it's kind of kind of funny to think oh, about yeah, like rock and, and uh another th- it's huge right oh right, yeah brazil it's huge and the other thing is uh eddie riggs was a brutal uh, okay so so the game brutal legend came out <laughs> 2009 and tim schaefer named the main character eddie riggs after a combination of eddie the head and Derek riggs so i thought that was kind of funny and on that note we'll probably close out it's actually funny because i was actually um, just earlier talking about brutal legend a little bit with my with my roommate with one of, with one of my roommates and that's it's actually really funny you bring that up i still haven't played it i have it and it's playable on this mac that i brought with me but all right well Oh yeah, dude, try that. Also, get Crusader Kings too, because I think we could it would be fun. Yeah, to try I that out that. With it's you. playable. Also, um, yeah, I just want to sp- express a moment of gratitude because uh, we're extremely lucky to be able to, you know, listen to all this music and then talk about it and sort of digest it and dissect it and stuff. We're really lucky, and I just I want to say I'm very gr- grateful that you're you're helping me out with it, and I'm grateful to talk about Maiden. For even two hours at this level of density it's really yeah, cool yeah i'm really grateful to keep thank you for inviting me to these and you know <laughs> it's it's, really it's cool. fun man i'm so glad i'm so glad we do that and i i hate the fact that we had this hiatus for like two months yeah, there was, um, there i was think i think moved for me, a few different other events and i mean i moved i also moved yeah i mean there's a lot of moving and the other thing is the um the uh, Judas Priest one, I thought we were doing Motorhead. I think that just sort of slowed us down. It's like, oh, we're going to have to do the Motorhead one. But we're now that we're going to do Judas Priest, it's going to be, I think, a quicker uh, uh, timeline. I think personally, uh, I think yeah, I'd rather push off Motorhead for a bit until I can get more situated with... Fly, fly away. Like, well, well, on that note, man, I agree 100%. But on that note, a thousand percent. But on that note, I think you should fly like an eagle. Fly across <laughs> the sun. Fly, fly away. Okay. Uh, all right, all right, Michael, man. Thanks for tuning yeah, in. No problem. Out. We'll see you guys when we. Let's make sure this recording is good because I want it to be pristine. All right. I'm going to stop recording.